Warning, this particular episode is going to be just jam-packed with thrilling mature content. We're talking all about scandalous historical events, complete with graphic descriptions to really titillate your senses. Listener discretion is advised. Please, won't somebody please think of the children? And just a tiny little thing to keep in mind. We all love being interrupted by ads while trying to enjoy some precious historical content. It's not like we could do without those ever so fascinating paid promotions that miraculously support the podcast's production costs. But hey, who needs an uninterrupted historical journey when you can have some good old product placements, right? Broadcasting live from an undisclosed bunker, it's the Reasonably Priced Time Machine podcast with your host, Professor Ryan Lancaster. Also featuring a good dose of mediocrity from the talents of Archie and Hildy. Episode 69, Dude, Where's My Tolly Doe? Welcome back to the RPTM Podcast. I'm your host, Professor Lancaster, here in our undisclosed bunker, where the air is stale, and so are our jokes. Stale jokes are just like history, Professor. They both tend to repeat themselves. Today, we're diving into the delightful mess of French exploration in 1608, the bureaucratic thrill ride of the Northwest Ordinance in 1787, and the epic showdown known War of 1812. And we'll wrap it up with the Toledo War of 1817. It's all just a distraction from the crushing void of reality. I'm starting to think history is just an elaborate setup for existential dread. And yet, we keep coming back for more. So strap yourself in folks. Let's explore the seen and unseen of history. Because in the end, we're all just dust blowing in the cosmic wind. Introduction Nestled amid the vast embrace of the Great Lakes, Michigan emerges as far more than a footnote in the annals of world history. It assumes the role of a distinctive character in the epic drama of humanity. This enduring presence has silently observed the chaos and absurdity, akin to a seasoned sage with a touch of intoxication, a metaphor for its long history and the diverse experiences it has witnessed. Michigan's historical narrative, spanning centuries, reveals tales of resilience, innovation, conflict, and the enduring spirit of humanity. It resembles a grand Shakespearean play, where Detroit plays the tragic hero and Flint the misunderstood antihero, both entangled in the twists of destiny, a reference to the pivotal events that shaped their roles in Michigan's history. Our exploration of Michigan's history begins with the subtle echoes of its indigenous peoples, the Ojibwe, the Odawa, and Potawatomi, whose footprints have crisscrossed the landscape for centuries, shaping the land and its culture. In this rich mosaic of cultures, these indigenous societies' unique ways of life become keystones for a broader understanding of Native American history. Their social structures and economies serve as portals through which we traverse time, gaining profound insights into their interactions with early European settlers. Yet, against this backdrop of cultural exchange, the shadows cast by the challenges of European diseases and forced removals stain the canvas, a stark reminder of the pain and displacement endured by Michigan's indigenous populations. The stage then shifts to the grand theater of European exploration and colonization, where French explorers, led by the visionary Antoine Lamet, etch their presence onto the Michigan landscape. Envision a scenario where Europeans in peculiar hats and elegant coats claim territory as if engaged in a real-life game of Monopoly. In 1701, Fort Detroit became the inaugural European settlement, a testament to Michigan's strategic significance in the fur trade, a global economic artery pulsating through the veins of the New World. Here, the interplay of positive economic development and cultural exchange grapples with the darker undertones of conflict between European colonists and Native American communities, revealing a complex dance of progress and strife. The curtains rise on the War of 1812, a pivotal chapter transforming Michigan into a crucible of geopolitical upheaval. The Siege of Detroit and the Battle of Lake Erie resonate globally, shaping the destiny of North America. Commodore Oliver Perry's bravery at the Battle of Lake Erie becomes a symphony of triumph, securing American control over the Great Lakes. Yet, within this triumph, the civilian population witnesses a dissonant melody of violence, destruction, and economic hardship. As the 19th century unfolds, Michigan undergoes an industrial metamorphosis, spearheading innovation in the crucible of Detroit's burgeoning automobile industry. 
The birth of this automotive juggernaut, led by visionaries like Henry Ford, became a seismic force with repercussions echoing across continents. Ford's assembly line revolutionizes manufacturing and sets a global precedent for efficiency and productivity. Amidst this surge of progress, however, labor disputes, environmental degradation, and economic disparities cast shadows on Michigan's industrial zenith. The narrative hurdles forward into contemporary times, where Michigan grapples with the fallout of urban decay, racial tensions, and environmental crises. The automotive industry's decline leaves Detroit scarred, a city grappling with economic hardship and depopulation. The Flint water crisis, a beacon of distress, thrusts Michigan into the global spotlight, illuminating the intricate interplay of social and environmental challenges. These issues, though rooted in Michigan's soil, resonate with universal themes of urbanization, environmental degradation, and social inequities, echoing the broader symphony of global challenges. Michigan becomes a microcosm of the world's struggles, a cautionary tale with a mix of tragedy, comedy, and a dash of surrealism. In the panorama of Michigan's history, we discern not isolated tales, but a continuum, a microcosm mirroring the ebb and flow of global historical currents. From the whispers of Native American settlements to the roar of industrialization and contemporary challenges, Michigan is a testament to our world's intertwined destinies. To study Michigan's history is to embark on a journey through time, where lessons gleaned from its past become compass points guiding us through the complexities of our interconnected and interdependent world. French Exploration of Michigan Picture early 17th century Michigan, a land where the Great Lakes glisten with mystery and the forests whisper stories from long ago. Enter Samuel de Champlain, who wasn't just any explorer but the trendsetter of his time, stepping into the Great Lakes region as if he's discovered the coolest new coffee shop. Champlain, who founded Quebec, decided to explore new places and visit Michigan. He's joined by his adventurous friends, Etienne Brule and Jean Nicolet, who are ready for action like the Indiana Jones of their era. Brule is the first European to visit the area around Sault Ste. Marie in 1618 and then headed to the Keweenaw Peninsula a few years later. Essentially, he's the first to crash the local party. Meanwhile, Champlain isn't just interested in claiming land. He's busy making connections and rivalries with Native American tribes, acting like a medieval diplomat trying to navigate a complicated social scene. This starts a long and complex story of European settlement in Michigan. Then come the missionaries, our brave pioneers with a mission, like Father Jacques Marquette. They're determined to convert Native Americans to Christianity and face challenges that would be tough even on reality TV. Their courage and determination set up the first permanent European settlement in Michigan at Sault Ste. Marie in 1668, followed by St. Ignace and Fort Mitchell of Mackinac, critical places in Michigan's early story. But the drama doesn't stop there. The French and English started clashing, and the British brought their chaos. Antoine de Limoth Cadillac built Fort Poncha. Trained in 1701, making Michigan a central trading post and a popular spot for Native Americans and French settlers, like hosting the hottest event in town. Michigan's strategic location and resources made it a key battleground in the European powers' conflicts. By 1759, the French and Indian War ends with the British winning. Even though Michigan didn't see any fireworks, this marked the end of French control. On November 19, 1760, Detroit shifts from French to British hands, welcoming British Major Robert Rogers, who might feel he's walked into the wrong party. This significant event marked a turning point in Michigan's history, ushering in a new era of British influence. So, what's the takeaway from this whirlwind of events? On the positive side, French explorers brought missions, which aimed to spread Christianity and cultural exchanges, where European and Native American cultures interacted, and a booming fur trade. On the flip side, the constant fighting between European powers, ending with the French and Indian War, left Michigan in a state of change and ended the French era. Understanding this tangled history helps us appreciate Michigan's journey, a story full of cultural clashes, such as the interactions between European settlers and Native American tribes, shifting powers like the transition from French to British control and the ongoing search for identity and influence. It's a rich tale of how the past and present come together on an evolving stage. 1787 Northwest Ordinance and Michigan the Northwest Ordinance of 1787, a remarkably forward-thinking piece of legislation, laid the groundwork for the governance of new territories in the United States. It was akin to an early guidebook for managing a new part of the country, much like following an IKEA manual to construct a piece of furniture. 
The plan involved the establishment of a governor, a secretary, and three judges appointed by Congress. This ordinance was crucial for Michigan's path to becoming a state. According to the ordinance, officials were appointed and a government was put in place in 1805. It wasn't perfect but it was a big step towards Michigan's statehood, which finally happened in 1837. One of the most pivotal aspects of the Northwest Ordinance was its prohibition of slavery. In an era when slavery was still prevalent in many regions, this was a bold and progressive move. It firmly established freedom as the norm in this new territory. Michigan wholeheartedly embraced this stance, entering the national stage as a free state, a decision that profoundly influenced its identity. However, there were challenges. The Land Ordinance of 1785 divided the land into townships and sections, creating an orderly system that led to land disputes and complications in Michigan's history. To date, you can still see the effects of this land survey system in Michigan's layout and land dealings. The Northwest Ordinance also championed education. At a time when public schools were a rarity, it actively encouraged the establishment of schools, paving the way for the founding of major universities like the University of Michigan and Michigan State University. These institutions stand as a testament to the ordinance's vision of a well-educated society. Yet, there were some drawbacks. For a territory to become a state, it needed a population of 60,000 people, which caused delays for Michigan and held up its statehood until the required number was reached. In summary, the Northwest Ordinance of 1787 was crucial to early American governance. It influenced Michigan's development in government, land distribution, and education while facing some challenges. This historic ordinance significantly shaped Michigan's identity and its journey to becoming a state. And now, a short commercial break in a word from our sponsors. Today, we have a mind-boggling sponsor that will challenge everything you thought you knew. Get ready to open your minds because we're bringing you a commercial for... Nothing. That's right folks. Nothing. The ultimate experience, the pinnacle of existence. Imagine a world free from the constraints of form, substance, and meaning. It's not just an absence, it's an opportunity. Think about it. In a world inundated with information, stuff, and distractions, nothing offers you the chance to escape it all. No more clutter, no more noise, just pure, unadulterated nothing. You might be wondering, what can I do with nothing? The answer is... Everything. Nothing is the canvas upon which you can paint your wildest dreams, your grandest visions, or even just revel in the tranquility of emptiness. And don't worry folks, nothing is absolutely versatile. It fits into any lifestyle. Whether you're a meditator seeking enlightenment or a minimalist decluttering your space, nothing has got you covered. But wait, there's more. For a limited time, we're offering our listeners a chance to embrace nothing like never before. Enter the code NOTHINGNESS at checkout, and you'll receive... Well, absolutely nothing. That's right, the code is just as empty as the void we're selling. So, what are you waiting for? Dive into the depths of nothing. Embrace the void, let go of the tangible, and bask in the glory of emptiness. And remember, dear listeners, in a world filled with something, sometimes the most revolutionary choice you can make is to choose... nothing. And now, back to our regularly scheduled programming. The War of 1812 and Michigan during the dramatic War of 1812, the Detroit frontier became a crucial battleground filled with more twists and turns than a soap opera. This critical region was caught between the ambitious young United States, the mighty British Empire, and Native American tribes playing a dangerous game of diplomacy, a significant but often overlooked aspect of the conflict. President James Madison sent Brigadier General William Hull to capture Detroit, a vital spot for both British and American forces. However, Hull's attempt to invade Upper Canada was less like a grand military campaign and more like a poorly planned school trip. Enter Tuckumsaw the charismatic Shawnee War Chief. 
He rallied a group of Native American tribes to support the British, using clever guerrilla tactics to confuse and demoralize American forces. Tecumseh's actions changed the course of the war and highlighted the complex relationships between Native Americans and European settlers. Despite many setbacks, the Americans didn't give up. William Henry Harrison, known for turning disasters into victories, built Fort Meigs and led his troops to success at the Battle of the Tents. These achievements, a testament to the bravery and determination of the American forces, shifted the war in favor of the Americans and showed their unwavering commitment. One of the lowest points for the Americans was the surrender of Detroit in August 1812. Hull's decision to give up the city to the British was so embarrassing it could have turned a white flag red. This defeat was a harsh wake-up call for the United States, exposing their military weaknesses. After the Battle of the Thames, Tecumseh, the charismatic Shawnee War Chief, was tragically killed, leading to the collapse of the Native American Confederation he had built. This marked a period of profound loss for indigenous communities, who faced forced removal, loss of land, and cultural upheaval. The War of 1812 had significant consequences for Michigan. It redrew borders, solidifying the Old Northwest as part of the United States and paving the way for the nation's growth. However, this victory came at a high cost for Native American populations, who suffered greatly in the aftermath. The war's legacy continues to shape Michigan's identity and its relationship with its indigenous communities. Michigan's rise to prominence in the nation began with this conflict. The state's unique history is closely tied to the events of this era, reflecting the complex interactions between indigenous peoples, European power, and the emerging United States. This history underscores the importance of acknowledging past injustices and preserving indigenous heritage for a more inclusive future. To date, the legacy of the Detroit frontier during the War of 1812 continues to resonate. It highlights the need for diplomacy and cooperation in regions with both literal and metaphorical borders. By exploring this turbulent time, we gain a deeper understanding of Michigan's past and a better perspective on our present and future. Lewis Cass Lewis Cass emerges as a pivotal figure in Michigan's vibrant history, where factual events and legends intertwine like dancers at a clandestine ball. His appointment as governor of the Michigan Territory in 1813 by President James Madison was not just a mere assumption of a role, it was a compelling act of drama purpose, poised to confront an era brimming with challenges. Cass, whose military success in the War of 1812 helped him get the governor's position, was often missing from his duties. Instead, he left the governorship to a series of secretaries while he handled other official duties. His treaties, however, had a profound impact. Cass signed away large chunks of land, a decision that echoed with the protests of the land itself as European American settlers arrived, pushing Native Americans off their land. Consider the year 1817. Cass and Duncan MacArthur, akin to influential Roman officials, convened with various Native American tribes at the Treaty of Fort Meigs. This led to the relinquishment of vast swaths of land, eagerly claimed by settlers. Michigan, once steeped in Native American culture, began its metamorphosis into a mosaic of European American settlements, each new town a beacon on the burgeoning frontier. This transformation, however, came at a heavy cost. In 1820, Cass, ever the explorer, set out to explore the wild northern part of the Michigan Territory. The Great Lakes region, with its untamed beauty, hid the source of the Mississippi River. Cass's expedition mistakenly thought Cass Lake was the river's source. It wasn't until 1832 that Henry Rowe Schoolcraft, the expedition's geologist, corrected this mistake and identified Lake Itasca as the natural source. But Cass's story isn't all adventure and praise. Despite the Northwest Ordinance of 1787, which said the Northwest Territory would be free of slavery, slavery was present in the Michigan Territory. Cass himself owned at least one slave, a household servant. Slavery continued in Michigan until the state joined the Union in 1837 when the first constitution finally abolished it. Lewis Cass's legacy is a mix of achievements and mistakes. On the one hand, his treaties opened up land for settlement, helping Michigan grow into an economic center with new towns and developments. These treaties also facilitated trade and commerce, contributing to the economic prosperity of the region. On the other hand, the history of slavery and the displacement of Native Americans remind us that progress often comes with a heavy cost. Studying Cass's time as governor is a historical exercise and a crucial step in understanding Michigan's complex history. It shows us the tangled mix of ambitions, errors, and injustices that shaped the state. By looking closely at Cass's treaties, we see how Native Americans lost their land and how settlers expanded. 
The presence of slavery in the region challenges the idea that the North was completely free of it, forcing us to face uncomfortable truths from our past. This study is about the past and the lessons we can learn for the future. In the end, the story of Lewis Cass reflects America's ongoing struggle between ideals and reality. It reminds us that history is not just a static record, but a dynamic story full of flaws and lessons. By exploring this complex history, we better understand the forces that shaped Michigan and the future we should aim to build. So, here's to Cass, a figure as complex and contradictory as the land he helped to shape, a lasting part of Michigan's wild and varied history. The Toledo War Imagine the year 1835. Michigan, a territory eager to establish its identity, steps into the spotlight. Led by the audacious Stevens T. Mason, a 23-year-old governor whose youthful exuberance borders on reckless bravado. The stage is set for the Toledo War, a comically ludicrous episode in American history, a territorial dispute with Ohio over a piece of land so unremarkable it could make a beige wall seem interesting. The origins of this farce burrow deep into the fertile ground of the Northwest Ordinance of 1787. This document, as clear as a foggy mirror, drew an east-west boundary line meant to separate Michigan from Ohio. However, like a hastily sketched treasure map, its vagueness invited anarchy and antics. Ohio, basking in statehood since 1803, interpreted the map one way. Still twiddling its thumbs for a union invite, Michigan saw it differently. Thus, the curtain rose on a confrontation that promised more hot air than a wolf huffing at pig-built houses. Enter Ohio's surveyor general, William Harris, in 1817. Tasked with delineating the line to Ohio's liking, he ignited the wrath of Michigan's territorial governor, Lewis Cass, who countered with his surveyor, John Fulton. The result was two lines, eight miles apart, each purporting to be the legitimate boundary. Leap forward to 1833. Michigan, like a teenager demanding the car keys, sought statehood. Ohio, flexing its congressional muscles like a disapproving parent, blocked their attempt. The impasse led Michigan to assert authority in the contested Toledo Strip, finding any Ohioan cheeky enough to play jurisdictional hopscotch. Ohio's counter move was establishing a county in the disputed zone, ratcheting the tension to a fever pitch. Enter Mason, Michigan's fiery governor, who rallied the troops for what would be known as the Toledo War. But let's set the record straight. This war was more a display of bureaucratic brinkmanship than bloodshed. Michigan's militia nabbed Ohio officials, detained surveyors, and fired shots that seemed more for show. Ohio, managing to inflict the sole casualty, might as well have received a participation trophy. President Andrew Jackson intervened and ousted Mason from office, cooling tempers and concluding the skirmish. However, Congress played hardball, delaying Michigan's statehood until it begrudgingly ceded the Toledo Strip to Ohio. When the dust settled in 1837, Michigan was granted statehood without Toledo. However, as a consolation prize, it received the Upper Peninsula, a rugged expanse rich in timber, iron, and copper. What initially seemed like a loss became a significant gain, a testament to the universe's quirky sense of humor and Michigan's unwavering resilience. So, what does this obscure altercation teach us? Firstly, territorial disputes are akin to family feuds, messy, emotional, and often about more than just land. Secondly, political maneuvering can sometimes defy logic and fairness, but persistence can still lead to unexpected triumphs. Thirdly, the bounty of the Upper Peninsula proved that sometimes, in losing, we win grandly. These lessons the Toledo War has to offer enlighten us about the quirks of history and the resilience of the human spirit. In all its farcical splendor, the Toledo War is a microcosm of the human condition. It's a tale of ambition, folly, and eventual redemption. It underscores the necessity of clear boundaries and the inevitable chaos when obscured. And it highlights the enduring power of diplomacy, showing that even the pettiest conflicts can be resolved sans full-blown war. Ultimately, the Toledo War is more than a quirky footnote in Michigan's history. It's a testament to the state's resilience. A wild ride through a familiar yet absurd world invites us to chuckle at our ancestors' follies while cherishing the lessons they unwittingly bestowed. Let's give a shout out to the fantastic team behind the scenes. Our executive producers, Ryan Lancaster and Ryan Lancaster, have been the driving force. Thanks to Ryan Lancaster, our sound engineer, for ensuring our voices sound their best. Ryan Lancaster's music composition adds 
the perfect touch to each episode. Our diligent research team, consisting of Ryan Lancaster and Ryan Lancaster, provides valuable insights. And a nod to Ryan Lancaster and Ryan Lancaster handling all things marketing and promotion. Special thanks to our families and friends for their unwavering support and the entire creative community. And, of course, a massive shout out to our listeners. Your feedback keeps us motivated. We're proud to have recorded this episode at the Ryan Lancaster Studios, our creative hub. Remember, the views and opinions expressed in this podcast are solely those of Ryan Lancaster and our guests. Until next time, I'm Professor Ryan Lancaster, and this is the RPTM Podcast. Congratulations, dear listeners, you've survived another riveting episode of the Reasonably Priced Time Machine podcast. I'm sure you're all thrilled to have spent your precious time on a podcast that takes you on a journey to the past, and by that, I mean the golden era of dial-up internet and brick-sized cell phones. But don't worry, we're here to remind you that no matter how advanced technology gets, we'll always find a way to look back at it nostalgically while struggling to remember where we left our car keys. If you've managed to maintain your sanity after this roller coaster of reminiscence, you might want to check out the show notes, conveniently located on the website ryanglancaster.com, because who doesn't love sifting through web pages? And hey, if this auditory trip down memory lane hasn't completely crushed your spirits, be sure to rate us on whatever platform you're using to stream this auditory antiquity, because your feedback truly keeps us stuck in the past.